Bill and I connected a few years ago. We've had some great conversations. I found out he's doing some amazing work. I love the fact that he's he's looking at a whole new way of <clears throat> moving energy and electrifying railroads, which uh, at the time I first met one of his people, I said, gee, if that's such a great idea, uh, why aren't more countries doing it? And the person looked at me like I was crazy saying, you know, hey, we're about the only country in, in the world that's not doing it. So anyway, so much for that. Uh, Bill's got a, a, a wonderful story to tell of all the work that he's doing. So Bill, let's, uh, let's get started. Go for it. Cool. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm Bill Moyer, not of any particular fame. Uh, the, uh, I lead a group called Backbone Campaign. It's based in the Pacific Northwest. I'm in our offices right now on Vashon Island. And uh, you may have heard of some of the stuff that Backbone has done. We were the ones who did the kayaktivist to try to stop Shell's Arctic drilling in Seattle. So we, uh, we trained all the kayakers to paddle out in front of the, uh, the oil rig. Um, we, we've had giant puppets that I know you're familiar with out there because I work with uh, Christopher Letter of Puppet Farm Arts in uh, Minneapolis and others out there um, to do for progressive causes. Uh, living in the Pacific Northwest, as the coal industry uh, and railroads were conspiring to turn our region into a fossil fuel corridor to Asia, uh, we were part of the training and the active mobilization of activists uh, to, to, to stop that. And <clears throat> whether it be coal ports or oil export terminals, uh, you know, we have been highly successful in, in shutting down those new projects in the Pacific Northwest. But uh, like I, I like to say that our no as movement activists is only as powerful as our yes is compelling. So, uh, you know, it's really important for us to lead with a vision. So during that time, I met some railroad labor folks and I said to them, they were testifying in support of these coal terminals. And I said, really? can this truly be the highest value use of our railway infrastructure to be exporting at that time, not just coal and oil, but, but jobs to Asia to then import stuff and meanwhile acidify the oceans, et cetera. And so uh, this one guy, Mike Elliott, gave me a 2008 Northern Corridor Modernization paper, which honestly, I didn't even know what the Northern Corridor really consisted of. I'm still always on a pretty steep learning curve when it comes to railroads. There's a lot to learn. And it's really fun to always you know, come into circles like this where there are people like Barbara who know a lot more about certain <laughs> rail things than I will ever know. So, um, so with some humility, I wanna present pretty in pretty rapid fire. And I know I'm gonna squeeze a lot into a short amount of time, but um, this all is all available online. So I'm happy to share it. So you can go through it more slowly at another point and uh, ask questions, et cetera. But um, so what happened is uh, we took that, um, uh, we took that video, I mean, no, that paper from, uh, from uh, 2008. And I worked with a team of folks to, uh, to uh, turn it into a, um, pardon me one second. As I was saying, we were challenged to uh, modernize this, green this 2008 paper on the northern corridor the northern corridor is a rail corridor between the pacific northwest and chicago and it goes through your your territory so <clears throat> um i felt like that was really important challenge uh because movement building is always about creating alliances and strengthening alliances and honestly it's also about undermining the alliances of your opponent so uh separating the railroad labor from the coal from Peabody Coal and BNSF it was a strong way for us to um, support our <clears throat> our movement. Um, so I am going to allow a three minute video to introduce our um, our conversation here because it's just way more efficient than I will ever be. And uh, so and I'll come right in as soon as that's done and start the slideshow if that's cool with y'all. OK, so uh hopefully you're seeing the screen 
Is that true? Yes, we are. Awesome. So now we're going to see. Solutionary Rail, a people-powered campaign to electrify America's railroads and open corridors to a clean energy future. Our vision is to electrify major rail corridors for faster, cleaner trains that provide a more reliable service for people and goods. We want to draw high-value cargo off of roads and back onto the tracks for highly efficient transportation and near-zero carbon emissions. And we envision opening rail corridors for the transmission of renewable energy, unlocking stranded wind and solar assets, which will not only power the trains, but also the communities they travel to. The United States has the largest economy in the world, yet its transportation infrastructure is overloaded, underfunded, and crumbling. Meanwhile, we are failing to provide solutions for the most pressing environmental and economic needs of the 21st century. The taxpayer-subsidized highway system built in the 1950s triggered an exodus of freight and passengers off of the trains and onto cars and trucks, accelerating the decline of U.S. railroads. Rail transport was forced to become increasingly dependent on moving cheap, heavy, and often dangerous payloads with longer, slower-moving trains making fewer stops and abandoning regular service to the communities that they served. Now, ever smaller crews are forced to work without schedules, on call 24-7, which results in chronic fatigue that endangers workers and trackside communities. Meanwhile, semi-trucks clog ports, towns, and freeways, causing disproportionate wear and tear on our roads, killing thousands each year on freeways, and polluting the air with diesel exhaust. The rest of the world is overcoming these problems by electrifying their railroads. Many countries in Europe and Asia have made massive investments in publicly owned railroads that rapidly transport goods and people. Unlike national railroads of other countries, U.S. freight railroads are almost entirely owned and operated by private companies, maintaining their own tracks, unable and unwilling to make the large long-time investments for electrification and track modification. Solutionary Rail addresses these challenges through a tax-exempt, not-for-profit Steel Interstate Development Authority, creating a public-private partnership with railroads and other stakeholders to finance, build, and operate the electrification and transmission infrastructure. Our vision champions the needs of numerous stakeholders for rail workers, minimum crew sizes, set schedules, and improved working conditions for passengers, decreased travel times through higher speed rail networks. For farmers, increased capacity for bulk commodities and faster, more reliable service for moving perishable crops to market. For tribes, right-of-way justice, energy sovereignty, and export opportunities. For trackside communities, reduced air pollution from diesel exhaust. For green energy developers and rural electric co-ops, new transmission opportunities and access to distant customers for the railroad industry, increased market share of high-value freight and long-term vitality, and for rural communities, an opportunity for access, economic renewal, and cultural vibrance. Solutionary Rail is a people-powered campaign for sustainable transportation and a clean energy future. And now we need you to help move this people-powered campaign forward. Join the team. Learn more at solutionaryrail.org. Cool, thank you. Right, thanks everybody. So um, we care about railroads, not just because of their ability to transport, but also about the corridors they control. And as we mentioned in the video, the combination of transportation and, uh, and electric generation are approximately equal with uh, in terms of their contribution to greenhouse gases. <clears throat> the um, the transportation emissions, however, are um, are very much related to more related to heavy and medium vehicles, uh, heavy heavy duty vehicles than they are to rail. Rail is so much more efficient, but also there is more there are more trucks on the road, for instance. But um, so part of the real important emphasis of solutionary rail has become not just the electrification of the trains, which I'll get to in a few minutes but also a uh, mode shift of freight off of trucks and onto rails. <clears throat> and, uh, 
And why is that? Well, tra trains use a third of the energy, at, th th and that's a very conservative, uh, required by trucks. Uh, the steel on steel of a steel rail wheel or the truck of the train, it's called the truck, um, is a, has far le less uh, surface uh, friction than a wheel on a road. Um, so when we move freight off of roads and on to rails, we reduce wear and tear on bridges and roads. Um, we reduce mot motorist uh, truck accidents. We improve water quality, as we've learned, you know, the, the tires, the rubber tires um, have a profoundly negative effect on, for instance, salmon in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we improve air quality and, and uh, especially and public health, uh, especially near warehouses and ports where often is communities of color live uh, and are impacted. And we reduce, uh, of course, uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So um, it's pretty important in terms of building that coalition, that an alliance for transforming this in really critical national infrastructure that we appeal to more than just our typical allies. So having all of those various benefits is a big deal. So one, um, when you quantify, like how big is the problem? Well, the problem is pretty big because uh, using this freight analysis framework data, um, it's, it's about a trillion ton miles, that's a ton moved a mile, uh, per year of freight that is traveling over 500 miles. So, you know, over 500 miles, it really, there's not very much excuse for that not to be on a more efficient transportation mode, like a truck and off of a truck and onto a train. So, um, so, uh, and that, and that 1 trillion ton miles is about 40% of our long haul freight. So uh, we think that's kind of nuts. So that's really hundreds of billions of gallons of diesel, et cetera. It's a lot of impacts. One of the things that the new, the STB chair, uh, one of the statistics, uh, surface transportation board chairman, uh, Marty Oberman used last week uh, when speaking to uh, a freight uh, convention, a shippers convention, is to say that uh, since 2002, just the lost market share of railroads who have not kept up their competition with trucks, just the lost market share of trucks to, to trains has caused 123 million tons of greenhouse gases to go in the atmosphere. That's not with like what we could have done had they increased uh, market share. It's what we've uh, lost in the market share just in, the, so we're going in the wrong direction. So <clears throat> one of the things that Solutionary Rail has been putting forward is the need for when we make these transportation choices like we're doing right now, um, that it not just be about you know earmarks and pet projects, but that we actually do what the EU did which is to do it, characterize the actual cost of transportation choices, especially when it comes to freight. So in 2019, the EU published a handbook called Externalizing External Cost of Transportation Handbook. And, um, and they had it really hard, right? Because they had to combine statistics from all these various countries and then you know harmonize them to make it make sense. But through that, you can see <clears throat> this heavy gauge vehicles, HGV, uh, is uh, the trucks, and rail is here. And so uh, let's just go with climate impact, the, um, the little, this maroon, dark maroon, or dark orange, um, the, the impact of H high voltage, high gauge vehicles versus rail. And you see that it's, uh, it's, the trucks are far more impactful. Well, uh, they've broken this down in lots of ways with different kinds of vehicles, but at least it characterizes the problem and it's helped the shift to rail program, an EU program, uh, make the case for shifting, make it a, 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 a transnational, if you will, or a, um, an international priority or a priority of the e European Union to uh, shift freight from trucks to trains 
And this is, happens to be 2021 is the year of the train. So one of the concrete things we've been proposing to Keith Buttigieg, and, <laughs> and we, we get through, um, is for the U.S. Department of Transportation, STB, the Surface Transportation Board, and others to collaborate on what should be far easier uh, harmonizing of, of data to, uh, to characterize the problem. So when we make a choice, so one, we can look at the, 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 the current state of our transport choice, transportation and say, oh, this is a problem. Oh, that's disproportionately impactful, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can make better decisions going forward. So we actually put together a, um, a very, very like beta, if you will, uh, prototype example calculator called uh, an external cost calculator on our website uh, to sort of be an example of what they could do in far better form. And it, it looks at things like it uses a freight analysis framework data to, to judge the, uh, the impact of between an origin and a destination of the freight that travels. Um, sorry, so looking at emission costs, looking at safety costs, pavement damage and efficiency benefits, et cetera. So it's just an example of what we think that the government could do far better. So with that, as I mentioned before, it becomes quickly obvious that um, there should be a public priority to get long haul freight off of trucks and onto trains. And like you all know, um, uh, energy efficiency is a, is a secret weapon in decarbonization, right? We have to do new generation, et cetera, but we also have to take advantage of efficiencies. Okay, and that's why we start with mode shift. Also that utilization is what is going to bring about the pressure for uh, electrification, but we'll get to that in a second. So um, for uh, in 2020, we put together a moonshot mode shift uh, proposal for the select committee on the climate that uh, tried to make the case for this. And that was that. So, um, uh, and our goals are pretty clear. Uh, these are, if you look at, this is a, a Bureau of Transportation Statistics data. Below 100 means below 100 miles. And the dark purple is the um, modal share. Oops, that's by value. But, um, by uh uh of trucks and uh the uh light blue is for rail and i'm gonna switch to a different oops i'm gonna switch to a different uh piece there i like this one better uh this is the ton miles and uh so we're really talking about all of the freight over five from 500 miles and greater and of course we thought that we could also make significant impact on the 250 to 500 mile range, and even the short hauls of uh, 100 to 250. So um, we think that that's very doable by 2050, but we'd have to really get on it. How would we do mode shift? Things like on dock rail, making it easier to just get uh, cargo off the ships and onto the trains, um, roll on, roll off, or what they call row row technology that we've used in the past, where the trucks can roll onto a, a train and, and roll off of a train. And we another thing is to protect short line railroads and, and connect and protect access for communities uh, so they are traditionally served by rail, but are no longer served. So <clears throat> this is a, just a picture of on dock rail. This is in Tacoma where the Milwaukee Road used to terminate, uh, where we have electric trains driving right up onto the docks. Um, this is an example of roll on roll off technology. This is Switzerland, where 100% of their ra rail is electrified and the trucks don't go through their new tunnels. They have to go on to a train and then uh, roll through. And there are lots of different technologies that are possible here. <clears throat> Whereas there are only seven major and soon to be six um, uh, major railroads in the country, what we call class one railroads, uh, that's you know, specifically or the big ones are BNSF, uh, Union Pacific, CSX, and Norfolk Southern. Those are the biggest um, uh, U.S. owned. Kansas City Southern is about, seems to be, to merge with uh, Canadian, uh, I always get this messed up, 
Canadian Pacific, I think, because Canadian National just was refused that merger, or the STB refused that. But these 605 uh, short line railroads should be our friends because they're hungry for business. They want to get trucks off the roads. They want um, uh, they want to transport wheat from the uh, from the branch lines to the main lines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're hungry for business. In places, this is from our every few years, they, um, I think four or five years, our departments of transportation are, are obliged to create a rail state rail plan. And Nevada just did a really great model state rail plan. And these pictures are from that. And they show really good digging into the weeds about um, who is actually uh, facilities with si uh, side tracks that are using them are in black dots. And then facilities with side tracks not in use, all the purple dots, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is like, let's get more of these industrial areas using the tracks that are there. And um, ironically, like Tesla's got this plant in, in Nevada and, um, and it doesn't, it's not served by rail, it's not even next to the tracks. And what's happening with a lot of the warehouses that Amazon and such are putting in, they're really putting them next to freeways and airports and forgetting about rail, which is really bad. So this group is really about a lot, a lot about electrification. So um, yeah, we're not letting go of that. We think electrification is super important, but greater utilization is for the reasons we said about efficiency, et cetera, is also very important. And, um, and greater utilization will justify the expense of electrification. So in, again, why are electric trains even better than normal trains? Well, as you know, electricity can come from renewable resources. Electricity costs less than diesel. Electric motives, are, mo locomotives, just like other uh, electric engines, are easier to maintain, fewer moving parts. We can employ regenerative braking. That reduces consumption. And electric locomotives add capacity because electric motors are, have a more rapid deceleration, acceleration and deceleration that actually adds capacity so you can have more trains on a line. We had this chart in the book that we produced um, in 2016, so these are even dated. The numbers are better now, but um, you know the rest of the world is already doing this, right? They're electrifying their railroads. If we had 64% or 46% of our railroads, as you'll see, electrified, that would be a big deal. We've got 1%, and that's the Northwest Northeast Corridor. So, <clears throat> mode shift will expand rail greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Um, and impacts unless we electrify it. So, and who's impacted? You know, workers and trackside communities. So that's another labor and environmental justice uh, natural alliance. So we think that we're part of this M moving forward network, a coalition of environmental justice organizations around the country that are uh, fighting for air quality and public health in the communities where they live because they're disproportionately impacted by diesel emissions from freight transport system. Um, uh, sometimes in places there, <clears throat> they have thousands and thousands of 15,000 trucks a day, for instance, going through neighborhoods and going through San Bernardino. So, and what does that do? The, 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 the diesel emissions are, uh, from the rail yards even, are, are, are uh, extremely harmful to these communities. So, um, th those communities and those workers are suffering. So how do we start with electrification of rail? Now I'll tell you, well, we'll get into that. Uh, ports, drainage, electrify the ports, just get the ports electrified, get the machinery electrified, get the cranes electrified, make sure that the, the ships can plug in when they get to port. Drainage, drainage is the short haul of the freight that's you know, like being transported from the ship to a rail yard or to a warehouse or from uh, one container to another kind of container. Um, so that drayage, and drayage has got our most vulnerable workers. Those truck drivers are sitting in these uh, uh, these uh, uh, idling uh, trucks for hours at a time, sucking in diesel exhaust. They're the lowest paid on the um, trucking ecosystem. And they um, are often uh, immigrants or non undocumented workers, and they're easily uh, undermined or um, um, uh, exploited, and programs for cleaning up trucks in the ports or cleaning up drayage or electrifying those trucks. 
those we have to make sure as allies that those those programs support the truckers, not just big conglomerate uh, or uh, corporations that still that then uh, don't benefit the the truckers who are driving them. Rail yards are another place that, that where workers are impacted and um, rail uh, trains sit there, locomotives idling for hours, polluting the neighborhoods around them. Those immediately should be electrified. Um, and in and, and ironically, they get the oldest, crappiest gear for hauling stuff around. And then obviously it's the main lines, the, the lines where they're the longest stretches, where the most uh, quarters, uh, the most utilization happens. <clears throat> so um, we do have a lot of rail in the United States still, even though it's a lot less than what we used to have, but a 40, 140,000 miles of track. The Department of Defense uh, designates 38, uh, you know, approximately 39,000 miles as strategic rail corridor, StrackNet. That might be a place to start. If not that, uh, partnering with the BNSF to do, say, it's Northern Transcon or Southern Transcon. That would be a smart move, and you'll see why those transcons are particularly cool. And then, um, uh, or, you know, other, other thick lines where there's greater utilization. So we think this is important uh, for jobs. We think this is important for decarbonization. The railroad companies are going to say, oh, we want to do LNG trains. And then they're kind of let go of that. And then they, oh, we want to do uh, 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 fuel cell trains. And and then, you know we that's probably problematic and we have a discussion about that but um, um but they they they'll say oh now yeah we'll we'll use batteries uh but you know we all have to be aware that we don't want to trade one uh resource dependent you know extractive uh and waste stream uh that's poisonous and politically complicated for another one right we want to solve all the problems and we so we want to use batteries to the extent we need to use batteries but if it's more efficient to grab it out of an overhead line, uh, then we should do that. And we should use the batteries on locomotives to bridge the gaps between those places. So whereas if it's super hard to put in overhead line, having a, a, a locomotive that can switch to battery, perfect, no problem. Okay, sorry for the pace here, folks, but again, I hope uh, we can um, get through and then clarify with questions. The third aspect of solutionary rail is transmission. Connecting regions to increase energy supply and stabilize the variability of renewable energy. So I don't know if you all saw in 2016, there was a, a really important article by the journal Nature on climate um, in regards to getting to 80% renewables by 2030. We'll get to that. One, uh, We've got a lot of renewable energy potential, what they, people like to call stranded assets around the country, right? Southeast, Southwest, I mean, we have a lot of solar. In the middle of the country, like where you are, and, and I guess, you know, um, uh, west of you, uh, is really windy, right? Yep. So, uh, but transmission, and, and sharing that transmission means you have to do it in an efficient way so you don't lose a lot in the line in the in the transfer. So um, and the other piece is it doesn't do any good unless you have to, you can't do the build out you can't even get funding financing to do the build out of renewable energy, unless you have a place for that energy to go. Especially in even like the surplus energy at peak production so access to transmission is a prerequisite right. One of the largest obstacles to energy transmission is a lot in the US and stabilizing between weather systems and, and weather you know regions where it was windy one place and not windy someplace else, et cetera. Balancing that is the need for a high voltage DC, high voltage DC being more efficient for the long haul for the long uh, transmission, long distance transmission. So this idea of a national supergrid is something you know I think we're starting to hear about. And you know, folks have tried to do it in the public sector. I'd argue that the na nation really deserves this. And we should invest in it for the public sector in the in the public sector. Um, and so speak and I'll get to a map about the the NOAA study, um, because we think that with an HVDC supergrid, it is doable to get to 80% uh, renewables by 2030, which is now right around the corner. 
So, um, and since we wrote the book where we had overhead lines featured, um, we've started to look, see like the Sioux line and uh, in from like, I think it's around Duluth and um, uh, into Illinois possibly. I mean, I'm a little foggy on the details, but they're doing buried HVDC. You probably know, all know more about it than I do, but they're, and what are they using? They're using railroad corridor. So, uh, and, and voltage source converters. So burying high voltage uh, direct current transmission and, uh, and stepping it back and forth between AC and DC has become cheaper. So this is a good thing because it's less of those overhead lines, towers, less forest fires in places. Uh, it's a, kind of a big deal right now. So the largest obstacle to national grid, it is right of way. Hmm. Here's that study I referred to. These are computer generated lines. The most important part of the study is not the sources of generation. It's the lines that, that make it stable. The computer came up with. Now, what I love about this is when you compare that map to this is an old passenger rail map that's actually more ambitious than the current Amtrak supposed vision because um, it actually serves Montana um, is uh, and other places. Is that, but look, what I'm really here for is to talk about the density of the lines. So to me, that's like, oh, those that transmission could happen on railroad corridors. We already have uh, right away. This is a recent thing done by um, the guy, the blog, um, uh, Volt, David Roberts, I think is the name of the blog. Um, this is a piece on this some months ago, mentioned Solutionary Rail. But it's just another map. Uh, about uh, transmission. <clears throat> and we know that, again, building this uh, an unconventional line so we can actually do this stuff means that we can talk about other stuff like, wow, what about rural depopulation and the chronic uh, challenges that those communities are having? How does our proposal help those communities? How does it reflect their needs and aspirations? How about the huge portion of the country that's served by um, rural electric co-ops, uh, supposedly democracy, democratic entities that are uh, providing the, that rural electricity, um, why not enable them to be uh, creating more surplus and exporting that power? Um, and then of course, uh, expanding passenger service, obviously. Another key ally and important place to keep a, a social justice perspective is uh, tribes uh, for uh, energy sovereignty or um, energy transmission, uh, economic development, but also what it, we've been educated to, to call right of way justice. So that when we expand the use of these rights of way, whether that be for transmission or increased rail traffic, that that be as an opportunity to uh, come to a better, uh, more just uh, equitable agreement with the, the host tribes whose land those, uh, those uh, tracks and wires cross. So, um, and we know that tribes are interested in renewable energy development. <clears throat> this map of, as of the Standing Rock Reservation, there's a BNSF line going through it. The dark yellow is the high uh, energy and uh, wind, energy intensity wind. And, um, and this is part of a 29 tribe brochure done like in 2012 or something like that for um, calling for uh, investment in tribal wind energy. <clears throat> so um, these are opportunities to address this problem of, of energy, uh, of decarbonization. And it just seemed like when we promoted, promote, did this book that we were coming up with a win-win and, uh, and that, right, who would, who'd, who could be possibly opposed to it? We proposed like, public investment with uh, through what we call the Steel Interstate Development Authority um, that would own and operate this. It would put more track and energy and infrastructure and transmission into the public domain. Um, it would issue tax exempt bonds, oversee the funding and running, et cetera, <clears throat> charge user fees to the railroads and transmission industry. and um, uh, negotiate right away um, and make direct investments. Uh, anyway, we don't need to get lost in those weeds. But, you know, we we're pretty surprised 
that uh hey people we this i didn't just just didn't like take off because who opposed it the class one railroads the ones we thought were gonna we're gonna uh, benefit the most so let's see um sorry about that all right why why would they be against that well it turns out that the railroads those big four five six seven canadian pacific canadian national are owned in canada but they and everybody but bnsf is publicly traded on the stock on wall in, in wall street so that means that they become obsessed with this idea of precision scheduled railroading what they call psr which has nothing to do with precision or really schedules it has to do with industrial engineering to maximize profits and reduce operating ratios so their obsession with reducing operating ratios means that they're not interested in increasing capacity they're not interested in any kind of connection with the with the public that is going to have strings attached related to public benefits <clears throat> these companies are not struggling they they're getting they're getting these good billion dollar profits and putting less and less into the infrastructure and the improvements that they make are really to serve just the most profitable uh, uh, customers. So you might be a profitable town to serve in your industry, but you're not maybe as profitable as like the Home Depot or some giant uh, uh, agricultural conglomerate or et cetera, et cetera. So they don't really care if you have to move your stuff by truck because they'd rather just maximize shareholder value. So they will say, um, we're private, trucks are subsidized. That's true, right? The trucking industry, the freeways are subsidized. Freeways are an open access infrastructure where public and private entities can utilize it. And, um, and trucks don't pay their fair share and they do way more damage and it's not fair. Can I call you okay. back? What's that? Yeah, I'll call you back in a few minutes here. Okay, John, it might be good to uh, everybody. If, you, if you're if you unmuted, you might want to mute. Otherwise, you're going to be part of the conversation and recording without necessarily even wanting to. So um, level the playing field. They will say that. And that's true. We should do that. We should make trucks pay their fair share. And they'll say they want public-private partnerships, but only when there are no strings attached. And then they'll complain about electrification as a non-starter because they say, oh, we can't do that because of overpasses is too expensive. Well, everybody else is doing it. And the price they quote is way more expensive than what's happening for about less than $2 million a mile for double track in other countries. But anyway, that's uh, the railroads, some of their talking points. Um, they'll talk about LNG and hydro, uh, hydrogen locomotives, but to a certain extent, we either have a lack of efficiencies or we have a per, uh, perpetuating the fossil fuel industry's control that we're not okay with. And that means more greenhouse gases and, 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 and other benefits we're not gonna achieve. Uh, they're experimenting with batteries, but like I said before, that's really good, but really only as a supplement. We think batteries plus catenary, the overhead lines that are reached by that, um, oh, cat, uh, oh, pantograph, that's the word. I, we think that's the that's the win-win situation. So we think that you know obviously we need to do the mode shift. Um, the truck. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm going to skip through some of these slides because I want to finish up. But um, the 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 railroads kind of act like don't pay any attention to us. We're private. You don't mind us. But remember, we gave them that land for the most part, right? Those are the land grants. They kept way more than they should have of that. And, you know, this is critical national infrastructure. This is not just like some typical private company. They've been protected from, from labor disputes. Um, they're uh, protected in many ways. And that's why we had an interstate commerce commission. And that's why we still have a surface transportation board. But we've been protecting and deregulating for 40 years. That's kind of a problem. They are actually, I believe, exactly the droids we're looking for. So <clears throat> I think the public's interest is served when interstate rail quality of service attracts and has the capacity to carry 100% of freight over 500 miles. 
uh, when freight and passengers travel on electrified trains and the railroads share the right of way with the national supergrid, supergrid for energy efficient transmission of renewable energy. So how the heck do we get past these behemoth corporations, uh, the class one railroads uh, for these urgent public interests? Um, one is to re-regulate the interstate railroads and update this is a really key concept, common carrier obligations. That is gonna come up. Break up the railroads. We could break them up um, and separate. Here, this is an idea that I really think is honestly gonna would save us a bunch of time. What if we just made the stockholders whole? We buy um, the, the right of way and track from the railroads, even just on certain lines, if we need to start there and, um, and let them run uh, their the shipping services they can be carriers but the public treat the railroads like we treat the freeways and then we can harmonize those two infrastructures so purchasing key corridors for rapid freight and passenger service and the national supergrid and maybe we'd apply a national defense production act to uh, or eminent domain to you know take them on that's a, a more escalated fight and maybe um it'd be nice if we didn't have to do that so Remembering that interstate railroads are common carriers. Like utilities, they have, and like our rural electric co-ops, our rural post offices, they have a, a, an obligation, a duty to the public to provide service, reasonable amount of service, regardless of whether it's maximizing profit. So we can update, um, and, and honestly, I wanna just say, Common carrier obligations, we're we had the Interstate Commerce Commission and we started that in 1887. That was our first regulatory agency. And the basic fundamental thing was that railroads could not discriminate according to um, who and what they let on the train or how far it traveled. So this idea that stuff could go a long ways, but it couldn't go a short ways was forbidden through uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission. They had to serve communities. In 1971, we, in 70, we bailed out the railroad companies. We relieved them of their duty to provide passenger service to communities around the country. And we're still struggling to, re to recover from that. But the railroads were left, let off the hook. In 1976, and then in 1980, it got worse. We exempted almost every commodity, uh, including, um, including intermodal, those containers we see, from being uh, uh, being uh, uh, considered uh, as have as the railroads having a common carrier obligation to carry them. Common carrier obligation didn't used to be oh this commodity and that commodity. It used to be service, reasonable service to serve the nation's transportation needs, and then it got perverted in the in the mid late seventies and eighties, and it just has gone downhill since. So now we have all these exemptions. So now the only time the railroads will talk about common carrier obligation is that they'll make excuse for why they're putting bomb trains through your community or, or, or carrying coal. That's when they talk about common carrier obligations. And they're right, because the only things that are covered by common carrier laws anymore uh, are oil, coal, grain and feed, and certain hazardous chemicals. Pretty much everything else is exempted. That is bullshit. We need to shift that ASAP. And that's then, okay, so we need to do that. Um, we need to clarify, and many people, shippers, even big corporate shippers have been asking for the common carrier obligations to be clarified. And we say they need to not just be clarified, but they need to be enforced and they need to be updated uh, for, um, for 21st century values. Uh, and, and no, 21st century public interests. Um, so anyway, we think that, you know, local communities should be able, counties should be able to complain that railroads aren't serving their county and it's costing the, uh, the, the county money because you have all these trucks doing this extra wear and tear on the, on the roads and bridges. Um, yeah, revoke commodity exemptions and, you know, return, revoke exemptions of service, return service to historically served communities. And what's really cool and hot news is this last week, the Surface Transportation Board Chairman, uh, Martin Oberman, uh, started to take on the railroads. 
he's he talked about their uh, their business strategy and their service to uh, Wall Street. He's the one who he talked about all the other things that their failure to uh, to uh, to provide service has has caused negative impacts from greenhouse gas, uh, road safety, wear and tear, uh, uh, public health, um, uh, et cetera, and congestion. So uh, so this is what he says. The statistics show the dramatic impact of this kind of business strategy, precision schedule railroading, leaving aside intermodal and coal, nearly 85% of all tons and carloads are carried between the top 20% of origins and destinations. Smaller but profitable destinations are being ignored or actively demarketed. <laughs> what a word. As a result, that freight is on the highways contributing to global warming and highway deterioration. And he's uh, threatening to use the Surface Transportation Board's power to study the impact of their business model and get rid of exemptions and uh, and enforce common carrier obligations. So I'm going to, um, uh, and, and I've already talked about open access, what that would be, which we, we think that really would save money and time if, if the public controlled and, and managed and harmonized the, the both the, 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 um, the, the, the freeways like we already do, the national highway system, with, as well as the railroad system. So that we get, we only use tr trucks on the roads where it's need be, and that rail service is filling in the gaps wherever possible. And this is it's commonly called separating wheels from steel. Uh, so anyway, we think that's important. And I'm going to zoom here through the last few slides of all the different places where that could happen. Um, but mostly I want to get to questions and um, and say we can't do this alone. We need to do this as part of a large alliance. And that's why all these things are important. And I think that they'll help you reach your goals. Um, and I think the time is now because I, uh, I just want to do one uh, alert, al alarm bell a little bit that like the High Speed Rail Act by Seth Moulton seems really cool. But then if you look at it in the amendments, they've made higher speed rail, which is what we're talking about. Um, high on rail trains, passenger trains can go up to like 160 miles an hour on conventional shared corridor, on conventional track. When you get much higher about than that, you have to build new right of way. You have to build new track, and that's problematic. That's going to delay our, our decarbonization of our system, and it's going to and it's going to pull oxygen out of the room for taking care of what we call higher speed rail, which is getting up to 110, 125 miles per hour. Not being just obsessed about the high speeds, but lifting the lowest speeds to lift the average. That's what we need to be talking about. So when Seth Moulton has an amendment that raises, uh, that, that is going to eliminate funding for projects, for most projects that aren't up to 186 miles per hour, that's going to hurt things like the solutionary rail um, way of getting there. We need interdisciplinary problems for interdisciplinary, we need interdisciplinary solutions to address interdisciplinary problems. And that's why we're promoting the idea of getting all these important cabinets, sectors from the EPA to the uh, USDA to Department of Energy to USDOT to the Interior to our climate czar to work together to do uh, on the calculator, on the assessment, and solving these problems. So um, you can find all this stuff at solutionaryrail.org. Look at all the interviews we've done, and um, and I'm going to skip to my contact info and then uh, stop screen sharing and open for questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for your patience. I know that was a lot. Yeah, thank you, Bill. That's great. Who's got some questions? John Crampton, you had a question I saw typed in. Um, John, I, um, so uh, I see your statement. Now, the yeah. component of this uh, super good. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, there's uh, a, now an experimental uh, battery storage facility up in Cambridge that is a long duration battery. Uh, and, and it's uh, a low cost, significantly low cost over. Uh, lithium ion, and it's uh, from a company called Form, 
uh, energy. Um, and I think that, you know, part of the integration of the grid is also the integration of the battery storage, you know, and, uh, and uh, so uh, that, that was my comment there. And I think, I think all your ideas about integrate integration of the super grid with these, uh, with these infrastructure, these uh, electrified rails is, is very important. I, I was in Germany a couple of years ago and they've gone, uh, I think the, the Deutsches, uh, Deutsches uh, um, the, the German railroad is 100% uh, renewable energy now and, uh, and zero carbon kind of thing. So they've, they've, they've done what we could do uh, following your proposal. Thank you much. Appreciate that. Um, other folks, uh, um, Terry, I see. Go Terry, ahead. Terry Olson, you had a good question. Would electrified. Uh, so, yeah. Go ahead, Terry. So, I understand right now we've got a labor shortage. We're having um, problems with not enough truckers. That we're having shortage of materials. I'm in the construction industry, and right. we just can't get things. Even if their things are are in the manufacturer's warehouses, just getting them to the construction site is are are really problematic. But if we could do more long rail, you would be moving more freight with fewer folks. So I think that would also help solve the labor problem. Absolutely, the supply chain resilience. Uh, local for me, I'm I'm a fan of localization, uh, small, medium size agriculture, manufacturing, et cetera. So you know, one thing is to what we're hearing now is the word reshore. Uh, you you've probably heard stories about the, all the ships that are caught off off of the ports. Um, so one of the problems that happened, Terry, is that um, over the last number of years, uh, in just the last few years, the uh, I'm trying to find the number, but uh, the big class one railroads have cut their their uh, their payroll um, workforce by about 25 percent. So uh, when they do that, then you don't have uh, the resiliency or the capacity to bounce back from these sorts of situations. Um, we need a, a real commitment by those railroads to increase their capacity. But you're absolutely right. Um, there is a shortage of long haul truckers. It's not a very great job. And people will tell you, you know, we've got a lot of big greens that are very much interested in um, in electrifying trucks. And we're all about we think electrifying trucks is good. Uh, but for those long hauls, there's going to be the most expensive, the, the least likely to get electrified in the kind of time ticking clock we've got around climate. And that um, and it's the inefficiencies mean that that stuff should be on the tracks anyway. So uh, and and Teamsters and other you know labor doesn't have hasn't been able to really organize long haul truckers. So you know there, it's not like a, we're going to come up against labor on that. Uh, the, the trucks are important. Electrified trucks for the last mile, last fifty miles if need be. So yeah, this would be the kind of uh, system where we'd have greater capacity for and for uh, a more resilient supply chain. I put a question up. All right, Chris. Uh, if the fully load, do you want to just say well, it? Well, yeah, it just it follows with what the discussion was there. I had the question earlier. So if you if you um, load those fully loaded trucks onto the rail um, at the cargo site, you know where they're, and then they they go the long distance, and now they arrive at their near destination. Then you have sort of park and ride for truck drivers who hop on the trains and take those trucks off off the rail and to their final destination or what's the deal well i think that my understanding is that in a place like switzerland there's a special tr a cab that the trucks go and they hang out truckers hang out in um you know maybe it would be maybe they'd be able to get some of their sleep uh there and, um so sometimes i think the truckers would actually ride the train now one would hope one would expect that those truckers are being paid for that time, um, but uh, because I can't one of the, that. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you right now the semi-automatic uh, trucking is or automation of trucking is the thing that seems to be closest to the horizon, and that is where uh, one truck they'd be uh, uh, 
connected in the controls for it, one by the other. So one driver would be driving while the other one's sleeping. And again, this is just a, a recipe for uh, terrible exploitation. Um, so maybe it's the, the solution you're promoting. Maybe it's the trailers that are moved in those situations rather than the trucks. Mm -hmm. I think that there's probably a, a, a lot of different combinations of solutions. And, and I think that that's the kind of way we need to think about these things that, you know, whether it be the long-term storage and uh, it was brought up that we need, we need lots of solutions and we need communities involved in having to uh, build the solutions. It's like who really owns the trucks, the, you know, I mean, are they just like a pipe, you know, where, who owns the pipes, who owns the rails, um, you, you know, you, you know, because the guy on the other end, I mean, who actually hops on that cab and drives it off the train, I suppose it better be a truck he's familiar with, you know. Right, yeah. Know. That's why I kind of think that it's either the truck drivers go with it, or it's just the trailer and not the tractor part of the truck that goes onto the train. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. Bill, um, Mike, I don't have a question in the chat, but my my lack of technology understanding is is exposed here. But in in China, in Europe, they use uh, magnets, magnetic levitation. Magnet, right. 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 So how does that play in here, or does it? Well, I think it doesn't so much. Um, I I think what that uh, that one. What is the obstacle to doing systems like that? The main obstacle is right of way. So I suppose that one that this could be a building block towards that, but the right of way has to be very, very straight for something like that. The um, the my understanding is that there are, you know, there are about four city pairs that are really well suited to ultra high, you know, high, high speed rail. It's, you know, 220 miles an hour. Um, and but places like Seattle, Portland, it's not really very suitable. Uh, it's we're like number 29 on that list. Uh, so uh, my I think we're going to have a lot. And then what would happens is those those projects get bogged down, whether it be like in California or Texas, in eminent domain fights where they have to the, get the land. And then there's the, then there's the environmental um, review and you could just see it's going to be a long time before that actually happens. And, you know, a lot of times, like we found in Washington state, who's really behind that stuff. It's sometimes it's the big profiteers. It's the big uh, engineering firms like WSP Parsons Brinkerhoff, uh, or, uh, or it's a real estate uh, developers. You know, it's, it's, the, it's, it's not necessarily working class people or middle-class people who are um, trying to figure out, how to uh, have uh, jobs where the stuff they make uh, gets to market or how they get to work. And uh, because when, as soon as you have a 220 mile an hour train, uh, that train is, it's a lot harder to like get on and off of anyway, and design something where they can get on and off easily or it integrates with the regional infrastructure and other places that have done this, they've built from a system of, 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 of utilization that was much higher than where are so we trying to skip regional inner city rail uh and just go right to uh to maglev bullet trains i think is is a mistake and a bit of a boondoggle in a lot of situations not in every situation but um i think that maybe we should be thinking about also the energy that's ne needed to move something 220 miles an hour versus the energy that's needed to move uh, something 110 miles an hour and then do the do the math on, because that's an exponential right difference um and then uh and then do the math on on how does that impact our our transition to electrified to decarbonized uh, transportation and energy infrastructure how much more coal we're gonna have to burn for how much longer in order to power uh, 250 mile an hour trains. So anyway, you can hear the skepticism in my voice. And uh, there's only a few, I think, probably suitable places. I think we should build from what we have to what we need, rather than um, try to skip it and then leave behind all of the other allies that we could be bringing to the table in rural and urban places and involved with lots of other sectors of society. Uh, Bill, a question I've got is uh, what impact do you see with uh, autonomous driving trucks? I mean, it's, we're still talking trucks, but do you think that'll have quite an impact on 
trying to move back to rail? Yeah, it could. It could because, again, there's unsubsidized roads. Um, if, if we don't get the kind of protections we deserve, um, th they could be undermining the efficiencies of they're going to be more efficient, right? But efficient for who, for what? Like efficiency to a, a trucking corporation is very different than maybe efficiency to you and I, right? Efficiency for the public. So they're going to do, they're going to still do all that wear, uh, wear and tear on the roads. They're going to cause congestion. They're going to, um, they're not going to be, if they're semi-automated um, for long hauls, they're not going to be electrified. So they're going to be greenhouse gas spewing. Um, they're going to be going through communities, polluting and po causing public health problems. They're probably still going to be causing truck uh, accidents on the freeways. They're going to be more fuel efficient and they're going to cost less for the, um, for the labor costs. And so uh, I think they're, uh, I think they're, the enemy rather than like a complimentary solution. Yeah, that's that's my thinking. Right. Um, I have a question. Um, what if, um, maybe you touched on this, but you know, you mentioned Amazon and you know some big corporations that are moving a lot of product right now. Um, are you uh, are there any alliances that are currently being made with with companies like that, corporations like that, that are popping up all over the place that where they locate their their buildings, um, you know, their production, their transport, their distribution sites? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, our work with the Moving Forward Network and the Athena Coalition has been uh, around uh, the impacts of warehouses on neighborhoods and calling for transparency in the uh, impacts of the supply chain for Amazon. Uh, my understanding is that the warehouses that are often owned by third party developers are located near freeways and airports rather than than rail railroads. So um, the uh, the electrification that you hear billionaire uh, Bezos talking about is really about the last mile, the delivery trucks. It's not taking any accountability for the uh, for the long haul trucks that are feeding those warehouses and those distribution centers. I uh, I think it's a <clears throat> I, I it would be great to put pressure on them. I think we should put pressure on them. I think some developing something like a true cost calculator or an ex external cost uh, tool handbook like they did in the EU would be provide the basis for the uh for creating a um a true cost calculator that could be integrated into the uh the shopping cart systems of our e-commerce uh, uh you know leaders like amazon so that that people start to understand the true cost in public health and the environment of same day next day second day uh, delivery. And my hope would be that that would start to dismantle the power of the um, one we'd make would slow things down in a way, um, in terms of, of uh, heating the planet, but also uh, from by Amazon, but we would also take away some of the mystique and the uh, appeal and remind people how important it is to have um, brick and mortar uh, to have local businesses um, you know, that are owned by small, medium sized companies. So I don't know, that's kind of a complex answer to your position. Um, the danger we see in what I see is that Amazon is basically trying to build its own delivery mechanisms. It would be, you know, interesting. And we should certainly insist that whatever they build is electrified. It would be great if they would partner on a particular corridor for rapid freight uh, service, uh, you know, one can imagine that being a really cool uh, experiment. Um, okay. But I think that uh, I don't trust the uh, the accountability uh, and the interest of Amazon in the public good. So I, I though I want to force them to do good stuff, I don't want to be reliant upon it. That would be my point. Uh, Bill, a different question. 
Uh, you were talking about Oberman and how he's starting to look into the matter. With the reconciliation bill, is there any chance of any of this being in there? Is there how much support is there out there for this? Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. Well, um, sadly, I don't think that there's very much. I think that there's a, an endemic or a pandemic of apathy around rail and freight rail, and I think it's by design. And so um, the the people who know about this sort of thing or are thinking about uh, the problems of freight rail transport are often it's the big shippers it's the grain and feed companies it's the kinder morgan it's these folks who are pissed off about the the lack of service shortcomings of service that's why i think characterizing the problem as a public education tool and uh, for accountability is super important um my concern also my ex experience that makes me somewhat cynical is that you know, a lot of these processes about, are about pet projects and earmarks that get shoved into things, and it doesn't end up being because of by, you know, a more holistic design that is really trying to harmonize the system. And so I, I'm skeptical that we'll get the kind of solutions that you and I really deserve and want and that our kids deserve. Um, and that's why I think the going for the DNA of how we spend that money how it gets becomes um accountable to the public good um with things like and no we obviously we haven't even passed the budget right we haven't passed these things we we haven't paid for it yet so um uh we don't know when it'll happen so it's not too late i think and it won't even if when we do pass it if we do to um to be insisting that things like the common carrier obligations updating clarifying for 21st century interests uh, building support for a person like Oberman so that the other members of the surface transportation board feel like they people have got their backs. Um, they can only serve two terms. He's on his first term. Um, it's uh, it's picked by the president um, with two Republicans and in this situation, two Republicans and three uh, Democrats and they're staggered. Anyway, so I think we need to build support uh, to this leadership that we're seeing there um yeah it sounds I, like we should uh, uh contact our reps and let them know and see if they're aware of it so yeah that would be awesome right and this and the transportation committee in particular mm -hmm. so the uh the uh, you know it's i think that'd be really important like we've got